Okay, good afternoon everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, How 3D Printers Help Black & Decker Get Products to Market Faster. We would like to thank our presenters for being here today. Christopher Beretta, who is Lead Prototype Specialist at Stanley Black & Decker Incorporated, and Bruce Bradshaw, who is Director of Marketing from Object. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag How3DHelps. We will have a question and answer session after the presentations, but you can go ahead and submit your questions and we will ask them after the presentations are finished. Uh, questions will, can be asked using the GoToWebinar on your screen. First, I'd like to introduce Chris. He is responsible for many advances to the model making process, many of which involves cutting time and cost out of the prototyping process. Chris was involved in the 2006 decision to incorporate the Eden Object Rapid Prototyping Technology that has helped revolutionize the ID Prototype Center and the way Stanley Black & Decker builds prototypes. Both Chris and Bruce will be available to answer questions after the presentation, and once Chris is done, uh, Bruce will take a few minutes to talk a little bit about Object. I'm Leslie Langnaw, Managing Editor for Design World, and I will be the moderator for this webinar today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the mic to Chris. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Brett. How are you all today? I would like to start off by thanking Design World and Object for having me present today. And just want to tell you all about how we do things here at Stanley Black & Decker. And you can see right here all the brands that we carry under, under our title. I'd like to introduce you to our industrial design team. This is, this is um, the team that we have here in our main, main headquarters at Towson, Maryland. <laughs> I'd like to show you our two studios, our industrial design studios, where our designers um, sit and make the tools that possibly all of you listening to this webinar use. And also the um, industrial design prototype uh, center, where all the models that go out throughout the company for research and for meetings are developed. Now, we are a shop that's exclusively for the industrial design studio. We're part of engineering, but we don't service them in any kind of capacity. I would like to show you just a few of our few of our old school model making machines in our shop. As you can see, we are a full a full service shop. We have um, 5,000 square feet. We have a staging area. We have um, CNC capability, pattern shop, cold cast, um, cold cast section, paint section, and we have our Eden Studio with two machines, one Object 333 and a 350V. Um, here is where we print a lot of our print all our parts. In this slide, I'd like to just go over how we basically use where our where the Eden machine fits into our capacity. But I want to give you guys first an overview of our process. Here you can see in the slide, um, designers would first basically sit down and lay out ideas as they start to do the layouts of their tools. Um, they will start to do uh, rough. Um, rough 3D on where rough 3D is mean it would be very blocky, nothing finalized. These tools then would we would go through, we would use another rapid prototype machine that we do have in-house, which is the Z-Corp machine. Um, and we use those for just for study purposes. During during when we finish our our rough 3D and before we go to our finalized 3D, um, during that is the per during the final final 3D is when we actually will implement um, the Eden machines that we have. 
to check um, surfacing and engineering confirmation models and also to do final, um, final ID models. Um, on the screen here are just some examples of some of the final um, Eden models that we've made. Now that I gave you a little bit of an insight of how we use, how we develop our process and how we use and implement the object machines, I want to take you back a little bit in time to show you how we used to do our models before we incorporated rapid prototyping technology into Stanley Black & Decker. Um, we would first do like any other shop, we would basically, we would use our CAD packages and our uh, CNC programming. This was a very um, long process. As you can see, um, this process would take us, in some cases, an entire week to perform, from programming parts and setup and to flipping the parts all the way around. As you can see, once we had our rapid prototyping um, machines in place, our development time and our process time dropped down to days and not, not in the week. Um, it was a very easy um, machine to implement into our process. This is um, by the introduction of the rapid prototyping process into Stanley Black & Decker, we were able to shave days off of our prototyping time from a week's time in the previous slide to two to three days um, with the, imp with the um, implications of using this machine. I would like to take you down another traditional road as how we used to do our copies of our models. Um, when we would machine our prototypes, in many cases we would have to make multiples. Um, that is not the case anymore because now if we need duplicates, we'll just print two at the same time or reload the machine and print as many copies as we need. Before that, we would have to, we would do traditional molds and we would use cold cast urethanes to um, go forth um, in that process. But we still make molds, but we do it in a new way. Now, since we have the capability, the capacity of the Eden machine, we actually blend um, the traditional model making and also the future, more or less you can say, of the rapid prototyping. Um, in some cases, we don't even machine molds, as you can see in this slide here, um, but we'll actually design and actually print molds, as you can see in the parts off to your uh, left-hand side. Those were printed within a day, other than either machined within two to three days. So in this in this case, it's eliminated machining entirely, and we've mostly spent some of our time um, just in our CAD packages developing and engineering the molds. This is also brings us back to another old way that we've made. This, is, this brings us back to another improvement that we did, but I will first visit the old way we used to make um, our soft overmold grips. Everybody that has ever handled one of our Black & Decker Porter Cable um, DeWalt tools has always seen the overmold on our, on our tools. Well, in our prototyping process, we still put those overmolds on our tools so the designers and end users can feel the product as it would be for real. Um, this process could, um, could take, in some cases, up to a week to produce. Um, and it would be using a variety of difficult, um, different traditional model making techniques as in machining and soft tools, which would be silicone mold making. But now, as you can see, we've shaved days completely off that process by actually using Eden molds to produce our soft rubber, um, soft cold cast parts. Now some of you might be saying, well, why are you making molds, cold cast over molds, instead of just printing, uh, printing rubber as the object Eden machine can only do? Um, we print we print rubber when we need to, 
but in some cases we have to, we need the material properties of cold cast materials and cold cast rubbers for certain processes that we do in our company. And as you can see here in this slide, which is a comparison, in the left you can see into, um, Eden printed rubber parts on an Eden mold. And the other part that's next to it is actually a casted part from an Eden mold. Um, virtually the, the only thing, uh, the only two major pluses out of the cold cast part is the strength and the um, elasticity of the part. Um, other than that, you could put the two parts side by side, one printed from the machine and one casted from the machine, and you can really never tell the difference. And above is an example of that because that is all in, all eaten rubber on that on that tool, Porter cable tool above. And one part was casted and one part was printed, and I bet you nobody can tell the difference. Here is an example of an all eaten an all Eden model. Um, this was for Black & Decker, as you can see. Uh, this model was um, chrome-plated because this is the final look of what the model was going to be in production. Um, and next to it, you can see the model. Some of these models are done to such a high level because we need to show what the final um, product is going to be to the end user or in many high-level meetings or into sign-offs. But in the lower slide, you can see the ability of using overmold onto um, housings that are on the, above, on the above model. Again, this is only possible through the printing through the printing technology of the Eden machine or using the process of uh, the cold cast, um, using the, the print molds and injecting them with cold cast uh, rubber, like I showed you in the previous slides. In this slide, you can see how we've also, again, utilized um, the Eden machine, the Eden's um, capability to print almost anything. Um, we've done it, as you can see here, in a saw shoe. Um, this would almost be um, impossible, wouldn't be impossible to uh, machine, but it would take amount, a laborious amounts of time to machine um, the metal and to get the level of detail that we have here. Um, we plated it to simulate um, the strength and also to simulate, simulate the heaviness of the part. Um, and it also adds an extra uh, level of realism when we um, paint, when we plate these parts and add it to actually any of our models because it shows what the final product is going to be. But then again, I mean, again, this has shaved off um, numerous amounts of days and time off of our um, product and development schedules. Um, just by being able to implement um, files that we can print in anywhere from 15 to 32 hours. Here you can see a couple examples of um, what we have done with implementing the uh, Eden machine into our, you can say, everyday life of our studio. Here you can see the um, Eden machine has the capability to accurately check and support the company's needs. Here we have um, parts that we've done for tooling evaluation and for surface evaluation. And it just make it's just made a lot of things a lot easier. Now here is the eye candy from what you can produce from the Eden machine as we have done in Stanley Black & Decker under our DeWalt label. This is our 12-volt lithium line. All the models above that you see on the screen have been produced from conceptual to final production and 
print print models. Um, all of these models were produced using our Object Eden machine, and it has taken numerous numerous amounts of time off of prototyping and development on where we can truly tune in and finite the design and work in ergonomics and certain features that in many ways we wouldn't be able to do. We would still be able to do with traditional model making technology, but this is just an improved, improved design and capacity to produce as many um, parts and as many checks as we need to make an end, just to make the end result of the tool just better. Here again, this is highlighting some of our Black & Decker tools that we have done um, using the Eden machine. Actually, all the tools that are in this slide right here are actual Eden models. Um, they were produced for photography purposes and actually shown in a lot of print and also commercial ads. So this is highlighting the two versatile wrenches that we made and also our new trilobe 12-volt uh, lithium um, Black & Decker drill. And again, this is another, another slide highlighting the highlighting what we can do again with the implication with the implement of our 3D um, processes now here at Stanley Black and Decker. This is our brand new Porter cable line um, showing again how we can make a design better and elaborate on on a tool and just do as many iterations as we possibly need to work out the design and work out, work out you could say, the kinks in many cases. Um, all of these tools that you see before you, again, were made from conceptual to final, to final model, which you see on your screen here. Um, they were done using our rapid prototyping processes. And this is, you can say, this is our family. Um, I just want to I just want to say that everything in this in these slides here were developed um, by the designers by the designers here in um, Towson, Maryland, using the Eden object machine in many of its iterations, as I said before, from concept to final to final models as you see on your screen here, because none of these were production tools. All of this here was done in numerous amounts of time, but we've shaved off a lot of our general scheduling time due to using the speed and accuracy of um, the Object Eden machine that we have in-house. This would, I mean, having these tools to come out on time wouldn't have been possible unless we were able to use um, the speed and accuracy of, of rapid prototyping. I want to thank you for your time. Sorry for the technical difficulties that we had before. Leslie? Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Very informative. And now uh, Bruce is going to give us a little bit of a quick overview about the Object Eden systems. Right. Uh, Leslie, thanks. Chris, thanks also for the presentation. Uh, as Leslie said, it's very informative and, and uh, um, obviously exciting for people to see what Black & Decker is doing with prototyping and how you've advanced your technology. I'm only going to spend five minutes, Leslie, just to talk briefly about Object and um, the product offering that we have and see how it overlaps with what um, Chris is doing in his environment. Um, Object, as you know, uh, is in the market of 3D printing and, and uh, there's a number of te different technologies out there. What sets Object apart really from folks, the other, the other technologies uh, in the industry is, is really our material flexibility and detail that we provide for our customers like Black & Decker. Um, Chris, uh, using the Eden line, has 14 base materials. He referenced them in his presentation. Um, various rigid materials, clear materials, as well as some flexible materials that we call Tango that are that make up our 14 base materials. We also have digital materials that can be used in our Connex technology, um, and I'll get a little bit more into that 
in a moment, um, giving folks 65 different materials that they can use pretty much at uh, uh, within an hour being able to change uh, materials in and out. So it's a pretty flexible um, technology. And the detail that, that folks like Black and Decker and others get out of um, object technology is brought about because of the the fine details you get from the thin layers that's printed with with all of our machines, from our desktop machines all the way through our flagship Connex product. You can print very thin walls. It gives you very high accuracy. And the thing that that's neat um, in in a lot of folks' environment is its ability to be used in an office environment. In our in our office here, we have actually five machines in the next room from me. So uh, the ability to incorporate it into any office environment can be a benefit for some folks. Just briefly, I'll talk about uh, the different technology, I'm sorry, the different industries you can see represented um, here on this slide, folks that have actually incorporated object technology into their, into their environment, anywhere from automotive companies to consumer goods companies like Black & Decker, a lot of education folks, uh, both research and, and uh, academia. Um, use our technology. It can be found uh, obviously in the medical device um, industry as well as biomedical. So there's lots of companies. Again, I, I certainly won't take the time to read through all these logos, but you can see the folks that have, have actually reached out and leveraged object technology and have, have the, our equipment in-house. Um, I'll just talk briefly about the technology and how it works. Um, all of our machines function in a very similar way. and. Um, probably the easiest way to explain it is it works very similar to an inkjet printer does at home. Um, there's an ink head that's, that's uh, uh, an industry ink head, much like the one that you see in your, in your office printer or your home printer. And rather than jetting uh, ink, it jets a liquid resin that gets cured with a UV light. And as I referenced before, it gets printed in very, very thin layers. And so we build those 16 micron layers one by one to give you your actual uh, rigid part or your soft part, depending on the type of material that you use. So it's it's an interesting technology. It allows people to get very fine details and it allows them to get it fast. Um, one of the other technologies that we is we brought to the market that's that's actually proprietary to Omjet is the ability to print uh, dual materials. It's it's used in our Connex printers. And that allows us to take two individual materials, Chris had referenced the soft material that he's used called Tango, as well as our rigid materials. And I can take either one of those two, any of those 14 base materials, and I can combine them into a single part. Um, but what's, in, what's even more interesting about it is it allows me to take those two materials and by, by varying the combinations or the, the um, percentages of those two materials, even though I'm printing only with two materials, I can get as many as 11 different material properties all in the same part. So I can have a part that has five different durometers associated with it. So although Chris is not using our, our Connex technology, when he referenced the example of printing an overmold, because we have the ability to vary the durometer and the material property, we might be able to come closer to um, what Chris is looking for in his end product in a single print run, all in the same part, just by, by combining these two materials. So some of the unique applications that um, Chris already referenced, but clearly uh, we bring to the market because of the ability to print with different materials is, as he mentioned, overmolding. So I can, uh, with the Connex technology, print his drill handle uh, with the soft touch over the top of it and the rigid part all in the same print run. And I can print five different versions of that. So Chris could hold in his hand the one that feels the best, or he could hand it to a focus group and say, out of these five different parts that were all printed at the same time, which one feels good in your hand? Um, we can do labeling and text. Um, living hinges is something that's very, very difficult for folks to do in a prototyping world that we've made it easier. Because you have the ability to, to blend these materials, I can print a living hinge and it's rather than, and we've actually seen this before, handing somebody two rigid materials with a piece of tape in it, asking them to imagine this living hinge between them, we actually print the living hinge. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, gaskets and seals, shock absorption, impact resistance, and many, many other applications. Again, Chris referenced doing things like uh, uh, putting metal on them or painting. Um, lots of different post-processing applications. Just briefly, I'll, I'll just, in case folks aren't aware, we actually do offer a full range of, of uh, 3D printing solutions all the way from um, the desktop, which uh, begins at 19.9. So the technology that Chris has in his much more expensive Eden machines that he's clearly getting value from um, 
on the desktop for 19.9 all the way up to the, the Connex systems that I referenced that allow you to print dual materials, um, as well as a range of Eden um, uh, printers that we have in the middle, the ones like Black & Decker is using. So we have all those available. So, um, you know, depending on what your, your needs are, we have, I'm sure, one that fits your requirements. And this is really the last slide that I'm going to touch on. Um, again, related to materials, I've talked about the 14 base materials and recently just introduced two new ones. One is called uh, Object Bureau Clear that allows folks, I referenced the automotive marketplace, they leverage this quite a bit to do things like lenses or in the consumer goods marketplace where folks are doing glasses and lenses and things along those lines. It's a very, very uh, sought after and desired material and the ability to get that in a, in a machine that's in some cases under $100,000 is unique in this industry. And then we also introduced an, an ABS-like material that allows for much better uh, engineering uh, testing and functional testing. So being able to simulate folks like Chris's end product almost to the degree of what their final product is going to be can now be done with ABS-like. Um, so those are, we're excited about those two materials that give uh, folks a, a much better uh, breadth of materials to use object systems with. If you have questions, obviously, Leslie will reference it again, and, and I'm sure we'll do a follow-up email to folks to, to thank them for participating. But if you have questions on our printers, feel free to visit our website at object.com, or certainly welcome to, to email me directly at bruce.bradshaw at object.com. So, Leslie, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, and maybe we can field some questions from folks. Thank you, Bruce, and they are starting to come in. Right. So um, the first question that uh, we've got here, it is from Kevin, and his question is, what 3D modeling software is used for these designs? Um, well, we use um, um, Katia, Dassault's uh, Katia. Uh, we've used that for about 10 years now. Okay. And we have a question here from Terry. Do you do internal components for fit of confirmation also? Uh, yes, we do. Um, if the design is, um, if the design does have internal components of any kind, um, we'll print and check um, and do whatever is truly necessary to um, keep production going. Okay, and we have uh, a couple of questions here from Aaron. The first one is, can you expand on what a digital material is? Uh, Leslie, I'll take that if that's okay. Yeah. Um, sure, a, a digital material is, is, a, is a term that Autoject has coined. And again, it goes back to what I referenced before by taking actually two base materials, two um, real materials, and blending them together to get what we refer to as a digital material. So we take... I'll, I'll just give examples of two materials we have. We have something called Vero White, that's a rigid white material that we have, and a Tango Black Plus, which is a black soft material that gets you down to a you know uh, 40 uh, shore value. And I can take those two materials as my starting point and blend those together digitally. So in the same part, I can end up with a shore value of 40, 60, 80, and then go all the way to that rigid um, Vero White shore value all in the same part. So those 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 materials in between are referred to as digital because we're digitally mixing the two materials, the two base materials to get an actual um, material prop desired material property to match the end product. Okay, and Aaron's second question is can full assemblies be produced and if so, how are the individual parts held separate during the printing process? Sure. So, um, Chris, do you want me to field that, or? Um, well, I guess we both can um, field that. Um, it depends on what the. Uh, um, it would depend on what the actual product or um, 3D models are. Um, in the case of um, how I lay out the different the different components in each in each build tray, um, say we have two or, you know, we have a uh, housing that fits up in three halves, um, like a front and a, and a back, you could say. Um, I would basically just take the individual parts and then just lay the three individual parts on the tray um, and either print them to whatever desired um, uh, finish, either matte or glossy. Um, that is one of the, one of the other great things about um, the um, Eden object machines are is that you can 
um, print with the support on top of the material or not. Um, in many of the cases of when we do um, our industrial design check models, we will print them glossy um, because we would have to generally sand out the uh, very fine topography lines that you get it to get it ready for photography, um, and it just makes it an easier process to do that and print it in glossy. But generally, when you print them in three different, um, if you print the three different parts themselves individually, um, and you just put them, and after you clean them up and do your post processing, you put them together like you had in your 3D space in your in, and put them together in a physical world and they meet up every time. Um, I'll also add to that, our software, there, there's a couple questions I'll wrap in here. Someone also asked, can you take um, SolidWorks files? So mm -hmm. you can take any um, any STL file from a 3D CAD software that, that produces in, uh, an STL file. Most of the of today's um, software packages do that, um, but you can also ex you export an STL file, and in our software called Object Studio, that's the the software that actually takes the the STL file. You can break up an assembly in Object Studio and assign different materials to the different parts of the assembly right in the software. So if I was using a Conex, for instance, and I wanted one part to be rigid, and one part to be soft. And then I wanted the third part in the middle to be a blend of those two. I can select those in Object Studio and assign a different material property directly to them, and then it prints just like that. Because of our printing technology and the way it works, going from one type of material property to the next, they blend together and it becomes an actual homogeneous part. So even though it's an assembly in your software, the part is actually um, held together and it has um, the material property in the X, Y, and Z axis all the same. So it's it's pretty neat technology from that perspective. Okay, we have What's a question that? here that's going to be very interesting. What level of competency is required to use 3D printers? I think I'm going to let you take that one, Bruce. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Certainly, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, again, it is used in a lot of different environments. Um, certainly in Chris's case, um, his expertise and what he brings to the market, he brings years of knowledge and understanding of how the process works and how it works for Black and Decker. Um, so from that perspective, he's an expert in the field and, and knows how to use these things and make the printer sing. But on a real baseline level, it's actually not that sophisticated to use. I mean, certainly folks are going to want to have a familiarity with engineering. They're going to want to understand designs. There's, there's things like making sure that the design is watertight and software, things along those lines. But overall, to actually use the printer and to make a part come off it, it's not that difficult. But I would, I would would be doing um, the the field you know injustice if I didn't say you would want to have a, an expertise in engineering in order to to do use these. But it's it's a tool for an engineer that's actually trying to get a design that's not that difficult to use. I don't know if you agree with that, Chris. Um, I can agree with that. Um, with the proper understanding of um, basic engineering and how parts and components um, fit together and react with one another. Um, and a little bit of um, software knowledge, um, you can basically, you know, use this. You can use this printing technology. Um, we have let uh, interns, in many cases, in many aspects of our of our job here, um, actually not run the machines, but set up the machines after they've gone through, you know, a very minor training course that I've put them through. But I mean, anybody can really learn learn the the, the basic technology behind um, the three D printing. Chris, would you say it's it's much easier than than introducing somebody to a milling machine, for example? Oh, it's extremely it's extremely easier to show and train a person on how to use a three D package and and say the object software than it is to show them um, to show them and instruct them on how to you know, use um, C, um, CNC software and then also train them on, uh, you know, an NC machine. So yes, it's, extreme, it's extremely easier to show them an object machine than it is a mill. Right. Okay. Uh, what are the sizes of the working space? Chris, do you want me to, you want me to feel that? Um, I can feel that. Um, sure. 
the 350 that we have is a 13 by 13 by 8.5 uh, cube envelope. Um, it's 8.5 in the Z, and it is 13 by 13 in the X and the Y. Um, I believe the your higher level Conex um, has a larger tray. I believe that's a 14 by 15 tray. Uh, it's actually uh, it's actually the Conex and Eden 500. That, that's how they're labeled. Yeah. Um, uh, it is. It's actually a 16 by 20 by eight and a half. And then our desktop printers, um, it's an eight by 10 by six. So and there's a there's a range of printers that we have that give you all kinds of different uh, uh, envelopes. But the one that Chris is using is, is uh, 13 by 13 by eight and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for Bruce, there's a question here that uh, this person said that they saw you can produce prototype seals. Are they functional liquid tight seals? Um, it, it's certainly going to depend on the application. I mean, if you're doing a lot of high pressure, and again, PSI is going to come into play, but we see that all the time. We have folks in the oil and gas industry that actually utilize our um, uh, Tango material for gaskets and seals, so it's a very common use for it. Um, I wouldn't say it's going to be used for all applications. Again, I'll, I'll couch it by saying it really depends on the application and what you're doing, but it does produce a seal. It's rubber. You'd hold it in your hand. You're thinking you're holding a real gasket. Okay. And I think this is going to be for Chris. What percentage of savings did you experience from a project time perspective? Um, well, I was kind of waiting for this question being <laughs> that, the, you know, of how of what the title of the webinar was. Um, what percentage? Um, well, I wouldn't. The percentage that I can put down is not in um, a cost savings, a cost percentage, as in money, but as a percentage of time and manpower um, by utilizing the rapid uh, prototyping technology. We've cut um, manpower down um, to almost um, in half of what a a general shop size would be. Um, by, by using the rapid prototyping technology, we can print something um, in, say, 12 to 13 hours. That would take us before, a few years ago, not more than maybe five years ago, um, that would take us a week to produce and have, a, and have an actual physical part in front of us. Um, so in that, in that respect, we've saved um, time. And in manpower being, we don't have one person programming and another person running the machine or that same person doing it. But what we've done is we've allowed um, to save that person's time to get the part out faster within a day or two. And we have opened up that other three days if that person would have either been machining or programming that very same part. We've opened it up to either new iterations of the, the part of the part after it's been put into the designer's hands, or we've opened up that time window for another project to come in. So it's we've in many ways it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to put a cost savings because the machine costs money and material costs money, but we have saved time and manpower on what on the percentage of project i hope i answered that that i hope i answered it that way i hope i answered it good sorry about that. Yeah, Leslie, I'll, I'll just add, again, this is a, a, clearly a, a general answer to the question, but it's not uncommon. We, we see um, advantages in two different ways from many of the customers that we, that we serve. Um, many of them have quoted, and we see it time and time again, almost a, you know, a 25 to 50 percent reduction in development time. Um, there are a couple of folks that outsourced for parts before and inevitably they would say, you know, had I, you know, they outsourced six weeks into the design project and inevitably they'd get the design back and say, ah, had I known this three weeks ago, I would have changed this and that. And, they, and, and so they end up improving their designs uh, tenfold by actually being able to produce prototypes on a daily or weekly basis, so they improve their designs, and because of that, they're actually bringing products to market anywhere from 25 to 50 percent faster. Again, that's a, again, a gross generalization on my part, but mm -hmm. it's not an uncommon thing that we hear. Okay, Bruce, I think this next question is for you, and it's what's the difference between ProJet and Object? Uh, ProJet and Object. So, 
both of them are actual 3D printers. Um, there are, um, you know, I, without getting into tit for tat with ProJet, they certainly have some um, nice printers in the in the market. But as I stated in my opening slide, the material uh, availability and the flexibility that we offer is a huge advantage for folks. Also, um, the the the, uh, the ability to print um, larger parts in a more efficient way from a speed perspective um, gives us a little bit of an advantage over those guys and um, you know really the the um, again ability to print flexible parts rigid parts and the quality and the surface finish that you're going to get from an object uh, uh, um, printer is is uh, a little bit superior than the project and that's a uh, and I'll take the high road and, and uh, stop it there. <laughs> okay. Well, this is kind of a follow-on, it looks like. Um, is there any manual cha change-out regarding the printer head when different materials are printed, and what kinds of maintenance is required for such a system, such as cleanup, waste, et cetera? Good. So I'll, I'll give the, I'll give the, the answer um, from an object perspective, then Chris can give his real-life um, examples of, of how he works with it. Um, what's great about our, our printers is um, the, the ability to swap the materials out is very easy. There's a cartridge and it's basically as simple as pulling that cartridge out and popping another one in. You don't actually do anything with the printhead other than doing material uh, purge of the lines. If there's, let's say you're going from a black material to a white material and you don't want black to be, you know, residue to be in your prototype, you would purge those lines of the black material and then um, uh, just wipe the print head, uh, literally a 30 second uh, task, and then you're up and running and printing with a new material. Uh, there's no actual difficulty with the head or anything along those lines. Um, from a maintenance perspective, it's a very simple machine to use if you actually do maintain it and clean, wipe the heads clean, things along those lines. Um, you get you know years of life out of the print heads, you know anywhere from a year to two years, three years, depending on how good you are with the machine and and how well you maintain it. That's kind of the again the general um, uh, overview from what we hear from our customers. But again, Chris is a real customer that can talk about what he experiences. Well, I can I can uh, uh, literally back up everything that Bruce has just said. Um, it's very easy. It's just basically you go to the material change software, pop out the cartridge, and do step by step what it says um, to change out the materials. Now to change out the heads, that is another soft. That is another. Um, that's a whole another webinar. Uh, I sure. Would say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's and you know that's a that's a a part that gets changed like your brakes do when your car. It's a exactly part, things along those lines. But um, for maintenance, um, I would honestly say the maintenance on this machine is no more than, I would say, less than 10 minutes, 5 minutes. And af after every build, I clean the machine and maintain it. Um, and it's basically you pull your parts off, you wipe your tray down, scrape it free of any residue, um, bring the just call up the... Um, replace we call up the wizard and that pulls everything into different to different modes of the machine um, and it pulls um, pulls the heads over so you can wipe the heads down um, there's another component that needs to be cleaned it's called the wiper it's where the machine goes to purge material and also wipes the heads clean um, every so often during its printing process and you go in and you wipe that up and then you're good to go again and it's a very quick and very painless um, uh, process to go through every time I run machines. And to tell Bruce, I've had print heads last four years. I still oh, have wow. one print head running since 2006. So I've had them last a very long time. <laughs> okay. Great testament. There you go. Oh, yeah. Now we have another question here. Do all object printers, particularly the 350, allow for dual material printing? Um, I'll, well, using the 350, and then I'll hand this question off to Bruce, um, the 350 can only print one material at a time, um, but um, you can, you know, do a material swap and run another material after you've ran your one material, but I'll hand the rest of that question over to Bruce for the Connex. Yeah, exactly. So there, uh, it's a it's a interesting question because we offer a uh, an Eden three hundred and fifty 
and a Conics 350. So the 350 really designates the the envelope size, so a 13 by 13 by eight and a half. And so the Conics 350 does have the ability to print dual materials. And just to clarify, Chris can print a rigid material and a soft material, all those 14 base materials, he just can't do them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question here is, can you estimate the time it would take to print something like the case of a computer mouse? Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, Chris, I mean, I, you know, we, again, it's a lot of the designs and what you print are geometry in, uh, dependent, but in general, it's about a half an inch an hour in the Z direction is the print speed. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're experiencing the same thing, Chris, but. Well, our parts are generally um, a lot longer and wider, but if you look at the size of a general mouse and how it would encompass the envelope of an object printer, um, it would probably take maybe three hours to print the case of yeah, that's, the case. That's of a great mass. estimate. I mean, I've print I've printed parts that size numerous times on where I've gotten the file at say mid morning, and they need it for uh, an afternoon, a mid afternoon uh, meeting, and I've popped it right after lunch and cleaned it up and given it to the given it to our designers. So yeah, that's about the size of it. How long do the cartridges last? What's the volume? So they are a 3.6 kilogram cartridge. And again, it depends on the geometry. Um, so if you're printing a model, uh, all uh, prototyping machines have support material and model material. It doesn't matter which technology, and ours has the same. So if I'm printing a, uh, a cube that has very little support material on it, I'm going to use more model material, so I'd use that if I printed 100 of those, I would go through my model material cartridge faster than I would go through my support cartridge. So it really depends, it's geometry dependent. If I printed something that was a spider web and had majority of it was support material and less of it was model, it would be different. So it's tough to put a parameter on it, but Chris, I don't know if you have any real life experience or thoughts on that, um, but it's, it's a tough, tough know. one to answer. That's a that's a difficult question to answer. It, it's definitely geometry dependent um, for the um, for how much you use on um, how much you use material. But a good rule of thumbs that I have seen, and I've used this machine for over five years now, um, is you will have almost a two to one ratio in some cases. Um, um, two support cartridges in some cases to one model cartridge. Um, in the end of um, end of the year, when I would have to do um, a part part a part report on on how much volume we've used in our machines, um, it's always been like that. It's almost been a two to one ratio for the past four years on material usage for us. Anyway, you know it's funny. It's it's interesting because for us because we have all our customers, and we are can gauge it based on how much we sell. On month to month, quarter to quarter, it mm -hmm. goes anywhere from 51% support and 49% model to the other way around, and it ver it doesn't vary much from that across our entire customer base. So, you know, 50% model, 50% support, and again, very difficult question. It's obviously geometry dependent, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one is for Chris, and it's, um, Chris, did you use any other fast prototyping techniques such as SLA or SLS before going to the 3D printing, and um, is now all of your SLA or SLS prototyping been replaced by the object printing? Um, I wouldn't say that. Um, as a global company, as um, Stanley Black & Decker is, um, we've always used um, um, rapid prototyping um, in our development process and engineering processes. Um, we have just gone in the past few years to um, in-house capabilities. Uh, so, but we've always used um, 3D. Um, we've always used um, rapid prototyping technologies. Specifically 3D printing or have you investigated the uh, stereolithography or the uh, so um, we've investigated different. everything. We've investigated okay. everything, and we do have some other. We um, do have some other uh, rapid prototyping technologies in house as well. Okay. 
And this is another one for you, Chris. Um, mm -hmm. Someone wants to, you to tell a little bit more about plating over the prototype parts. How is that done? Um, well, it is um, actually it is um, done as you would take um, any um, part over to um, a plating service. Um, they would, you know, they would do whatever they would have to do for the parts. A very few um, plating um, companies around the country can actually um, do um, um, rapid prototyping parts, more or less like SLA and um, Eden Object or even uh, ProJet parts. Um, the parts um, for preparation, um, you have to make sure they're extremely clean of support. Um, the one thing that we have noticed over the years is the support material um, is a large inhibitor of the plating process. And the plating process, we all know, it is, it's an electroplating process. So it's a, they drop down their copper, they drop down an acid bath, and then they put a copper process, and then they do a nickel, and then it's to whatever degree of plating that you've um, invested in for, for that part. But it is, um, has to be totally free and clean of the support material, because that's a, base, that's a large inhibitor um, to, that, to that process. Okay. And can 3D printers be used, and I think this word is by dentists? Uh, yes, actually, it's a it's actually a huge market for us. Um, uh, it's growing. We have a number of case studies on our website. I encourage um, the gentleman or, or or person that asked that question to to visit our website. Um, it's very popular now in the dental space. I, for folks that aren't familiar with it, the dental space has been been very consistent for hundred years, everyone goes in and gets their, you know, you, you put that goop in your mouth to get the mold and then they do all that fun stuff. Well, it's now changed with, with technology. And so now they take scanners and scan your, your teeth and then print out the actual models on a 3D printer like objects and do things like, um, you know, the Visalign um, type braces or um, uh, bridges, things along those lines. So it's a very, very popular technology in, in our uh, uh, technology has been adapted and, and leveraged by a number of different um, dental labs um, uh, across the world, actually. So it's a, it's a great space and a great technology for it. Uh, we have time for just a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Chris, this one is for you. What material okay. was used that allowed the wrench to be chrome-plated? Um, actually, the material that we used on that was um, the Vero Blue um, at the time. Uh, We've um, and again in that process we have uh, basically we printed the material and since that wrench had to be chrome plated we printed it in one of the modes of the object machine called glossy. Now that means that there was no support developed on develop put on that top part um, on the top of the part um, when we pulled the machine when we pulled the part from the machine and we post treated it. Um, we post-treated it and cleaned it in a very light um, acid solution. Um, and we basically, by doing that, <clears throat> we cleaned off the very slight skim off of the support material that is embedded in like the first micron layer of the part. And then it was just a lot of um, post, um, post work as in sanding and painting. Um, but when we sent it out to the uh, to the plater, we blasted any of our primer off of it and sent it out. Okay, and Bruce. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead, Chris. Oh no, that's that was it. <laughs> okay, Bruce. One final question: um, Do you have a material sure. that dissipates heat? Um, so I don't know the, the direct answer to the question. If it, if they mean dissipating heat from the purposes of of, of taking heat and, and and moving it away from a particular um, part or, or, or a component of the part, we do have, our range of materials do have different heat deflection characteristics, um, and the ABS-like is the highest one now. So um, I don't have the spec sheet in front of me, but I believe it's, it's around 85 to 90 degrees Celsius. Um, so we do have high temperature deflection, but I don't know about the dissipation. I would have to, to get back to the first that answered that question uh, through email afterwards. And, and I think what I was going to, you probably talked about that. We'll, we'll, uh, any questions that weren't answered, we'll, we'll yeah. get back to folks. 
Yeah, there were still a number of questions that people have asked, and we don't have the time to get to that. But uh, if you saw on a previous slide the email addresses for both Chris and Bruce, you are welcome to send your questions there. And I think we'll forward some of these questions over to the two of you as well. So thank you, thank you everyone, for attending this webinar uh, from Design World. Uh, the presentation will be emailed to everyone um, in the next couple of days or so, and it will also be available online at www.designworldonline.com. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Great, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.